Have you ever felt like the game was rigged against you? That you go every day into the stock market to play at the casino and that the house always wins? Well, guess what? So do I. And you know what? It's because it is. And today, we're going to unmask some of the bad actors that have been working in this market for the last decade to steal money from average retail investors who think that they're buying into a market that is fair and balanced, come to find out that it isn't. And it's actually full of all kinds of conflicts of interest and shady dealings going on in the back room. I'm True Demon, and I'm the Devil Stockbroker, and today we're going to uncover the market-making conflict with Vinco Ventures, ticker symbol, BBIG. If you follow me regularly, then you know that I've already done quite a lot of due diligence on Vinco Ventures and covered a lot of fraudulent tickers in my past. And I specifically look for value in squeeze stocks, particularly stocks that are way undervalued, that have been heavily beaten down and shorted into the ground, and especially start to look for ones that may be the targets of fraudulent and bad acting hedge funds, market makers, and prime brokers. And so far, one of the biggest examples is BBIG right now. This thread that I wrote here in uh, our subreddit, r slash hell's trading floor, summarizes pretty much all the due diligence that I've done thus far, and I wanted to take people through it that didn't have the time to read it themselves and throw in a little bit of additional commentary that may not have been included. So after a lengthy personal investigation into BBIG and its recent price action, I've compiled this post to document all of the findings that I have discovered, which summarize the actions of Susquehanna, the designated primary market maker for Vinco Ventures Incorporated, and the stock which has collapsed to historic lows. Before beginning, I want to give a huge thanks to user the Niz 16 for doing a lot of the heavy lifting, collecting all of this evidence. I also want to preface this post by saying that my professional expertise is in the field of information security, specifically in penetration testing, network security, malware development, reverse engineering, exploit development, and network protocol security. So first, I want to give a little bit of highlights to BBIG and some of its fundamental data. So Vinco Ventures is a company which operates a consumer product research and development manufacturing sales and fulfillment company in North America, Asia, Europe. It offers toys, plush homewares, electronics to retailers, distributors, manufacturers through e-commerce channels, and personal protective equipment to government agencies, hospitals, and distributors. But what BBIG has recently been jumping into has been mainly into ad revenue and social media, specifically through their acquisitions of Lomotif, the popular social media short-term video creating application that has kind of swept India, as well as AdRiser, which provides ad revenue to social media platforms. So currently, BBIG has an outstanding share count of around 135.88 million shares with a free float of around 124.6 million shares. As of the time of writing, the shares sold short was about 34.4 million with a days to cover of less than one day. There's a few officers listed here in the DD. Um, currently, the CEO is Miss Lisa King, and the board of directors of Zash Global, who was the former CEO and chairman of the board, Ted Farnsworth. So a lot of the DD can be covered from previous uh, linked uh, Reddit threads that have been written by researchers that did an even deeper dive than me, but I will go over some of the uh, essentials. To start with, Let's look at the short interest of BBIG currently, which is trading at a price of less than $1.20. Uh, it hit a recent low of $1.05. And the days to cover, according to Ortex, is somewhere in the neighborhood of 3.15 days to cover on a three-month moving average. The estimated short interest, according to Ortex, is 23% of the free float, and the total um, shares on loan, somewhere around the area of 60 million shares on loan, accounting for about 33.9% of the free float. There are a consistent series of patterns in BBIG which have um, indicated to me that the stock is being heavily targeted not by individual investors that are shorting it, but rather large institutions and market makers. Part of what gives me this suspicion is the large amount of failures to deliver specifically surrounding large price action where the stock moved by more than 20% on multiple days and the failures to deliver that were reported during those time frames was 
extremely high. Uh, at the highest, uh, at the high water mark for BBIG, January 20th of 2022, the failures to deliver reached 8.23 million shares failing to deliver in a single day. BBIG has been on the threshold list more than six times in the last uh, in the last 360 days, and it just continues to get worse the farther you go back. BBIG in total since the stock IPO'd has been on the threshold list at least nine times. As you can see, security lending volume always seems to center around massive downward price action that is pretty much linear every single time. Whenever these uh, the lending volume increases, it slowly tapers off. Meanwhile, the price is in constant linear decline. The largest decline, which happened recently, resulted in the price moving down by more than 100% of its former value when it was trading at above $2.50. Throughout its entire price action since August of 2021, the stock has averaged a utilization of 99.9%, .9%, which is absurd to think about because when you look at the amount of shares that have been borrowed and shorted against the stock, it's always been in constant increase. The stock being borrowed on BBIG has never ever consistently gone down since the company had its squeeze back in August and September of 2021. And the cost to borrow has been at an all-time high as of recent, only matching one former time uh, back during the actual squeeze at the all-time high where BBIG's cost to borrow fee was averaging at a 200% annualized fee. What does all of this mean? Well, basically it translates to the stock was constantly being shorted even though by the numbers there were no shares available to borrow. Nevertheless, the shares on loan continued rising from 36.5 million all the way to its current level at 60 million. And despite extremely high borrow fees, shorts have not let their foot off of the stock's neck. It's been constantly beaten down no matter what kind of good news comes out, even during its dividend when it issued shares of Cryptide, the new spinoff company that focuses on NFT trading, uh, to current shareholders of BBIG. So how could I possibly know that a market maker is involved in this and why would they be? Well, there's a subtle giveaway when market makers are targeting a specific stock and shorting it in order to fulfill buying orders. Typically, when a market maker decides that it needs to provide liquidity to the market but there may not be shares available to borrow, they tend to resort to using short exempts. Short exempts are shorts which are only afforded to market makers and are exempt from the locate rule which says that prime brokers and anyone engaged in uh, shorting in the market must locate a stock before it can be borrowed. Short exempts are exempt from this rule, meaning that the shares don't need to be located for at least six trading days before they are forced to be delivered. This is known as the T plus six rule in regards to short exempts. Short exempts are also exempt from the uptick rule, which is the short sale restriction rule. When a stock is traded down a 10% from its previous day's close, it automatically is added to the short sale restriction list. This causes the stock to only be permitted to be shorted during an uptick when the stock price is going up. However, market makers, due to short exempts, are exempt from this rule. When you combine these factors with the knowledge that market makers utilize short exempts to fulfill buy orders, particularly from retail participants, you can see a consistent behavior. Whenever the stock starts to move in a significant price action, short exempts are typically used in order to fulfill the buy orders because the shares can't be located quickly enough. This is typically acceptable. However, when it's used maliciously, a market maker can deem it necessary to use short exempts even when it is not actually necessary to do so, either the stock not being on the SSR list for the day or possibly because they can't locate shares. If a market maker decides that they need a short exempt, that is the only justification that's required for them to do it. There is no audit process to ensure that market makers are legitimately using short exempts in order to fulfill bona fide market making activity as is defined in the short sale and uh, SSR documentation and rulings in the SEC filings. If you want to know more about short exempts and how they apply to market makers and how it affects the market, I'll encourage you to click on the link of the video that just popped up here above my face. You can go ahead and look at that and get a 
greater understanding of the language of short exempts and how they affect the market. What you're seeing here on your screen is output from Hell's Trading Floor's proprietary Scourge bot, the FINRA data analytics tool that we use at Hell's Trading Floor to find squeeze picks. You'll see that BBIG, which this pan, uh, this pane on the left, shows the dates of short exempts in FINRA volume data from August 15th to September 10th of 2021. What you can see from that time is that short exempts at that time had a lead up where short exempts were rising rapidly as the price was slowly beginning to climb and showing more and more volatility. Up until a point where BBIG reached a day where it moved by more than 100% of its previous day's closing value and it hit a high of $5.97 per share. The short exempt volume on this day exceeded more than 2.6 million, which at that time accounted for nearly 2% of the total flow to the stock. This was a massive move and a significant amount of trading that was short exempt by market makers. You could argue that this was legitimate bona fide market making activity because market makers were struggling to locate shares due to the stock being so heavily shorted at the time, but you could also argue that market makers were trying to depress the price in order to allow themselves time to locate more shares. And by doing so, by using short exempts, they defer their delivery date by six trading days, giving them time to locate enough shares to fulfill the previous orders. However, what actually took place is more buying continued and it became a bit of a frenzy, causing the stock to rip up all the way over the next three trading days up to an all-time high of $11.90. The short exempts reached a peak of $8.4 shares traded short exempt for a ratio that is the short exempts divided by the short volume was 9.48%. So one of every 10 shares that was traded short was a short exempt. This illustrates the difficulty with which market makers were trying to find shares in order to fulfill the buy orders from retail because they were coming in so quickly. Eventually, it was possible for them to catch up, but it only came after a significant period of continuous short exempting and borrowing and borrowing and borrowing stock in order to deliver it to defer the market makers enough time before they would actually need to deliver the stock. Over here on the right, we say we can see that the same thing is beginning to happen with BBIG with continued price action pushing the stock up up until a point where massive short exempts hammer the price back down. This is caused by market makers taking up all of the buy orders, using short exempts to fulfill them, and then routing all of the actual trades to dark pools and internalizers where they get filled in single order increments. Essentially, the market maker takes a block of retail share purchases. They fulfill all of them throughout the day with short exempts, and they continue to do this for several days in a row. Eventually, when the market maker has collected a large block of these orders and they have a huge imbalance in their books, what they will do is go over to the dark pool. They will find somebody who is willing to sell them the shares or sell them deep in the money calls in order to fulfill those orders. They execute all of those in the money call options or they purchase the large block of shares at a fixed price, delivering all of that stock to the retail participants. At that time, because there has been no price action actually reaching the lit exchanges, none of the retail buying orders actually had an effect on the national best bid and offer, the NBBO. This strategy of routing orders off of the lit exchanges is where the price action gets deferred to. This routing of orders away from the lit exchanges to internalizers and dark pools where they can fill a large amount of share orders in a single trade is what prevents the price action from actually going up. Why does the market maker do this? Well, market makers tend to prefer a low amount of volatility because they make money on the spread and the number of transactions that they process throughout the day, making tenths or one hundredths of a penny on every single transaction. High volume but low volatility is how they make their money. But high volume and high volatility makes it extremely difficult for them to, one, fulfill the orders and for two, to profit off of the orders because if the market maker has a massive imbalance in their books and they aren't able to find somebody willing to sell them the shares at a fixed price, then that creates a great amount of difficulty for them. So the last resort for them is to borrow stock from a prime broker, 
Here, an additional conflict comes in where the prime broker may be lending shares that are naked short, that they may not have located in the first place. Having covered all of this, what does this have to do with Susquehanna? As I said in the beginning of this video, Susquehanna is the designated primary market maker for BBIG. What most people don't realize is that Susquehanna also has a major stake in ByteDance. ByteDance Inc., which owns TikTok, is a major competitive app and the leading app in the entire world for short video social media. And because of that, there's a direct conflict of interest between Susquehanna and BBIG, who owns Lo Motif. The 15% stake in ByteDance that Susquehanna owns, while simultaneously having such a significant position of power as the market maker for BBIG, they have direct conflict of interest, which would encourage them to do anything that they could to prevent BBIG's share price from going up. If BBIG fails, so does Lo Motif. I want to. Uh, also take the time to go through this due diligence, which was uh, put together by the NIS 16 directly, um, because he actually pulled up the majority of all of this, uh, all of these conflicts of interest and, and pointed them out to me. Uh, and this led me down the rabbit hole that I've been traveling The 15% the stake in days. Bike Dance that so I'll just go ahead and read this through uh, for you. So first, the investment into Bike Dance. Susquehanna International Group first invested $5 million in Bike Dance in 2012. Would encourage them Said to do was anything the big that they could investor. to prevent BBIG Bike Dance share at the price time from struggling going up. to find financing BBIG for Susquehanna fails, so does Lomo T. And Susquehanna has continued to invest in Bike Dance over the years. It's now a 15% owner of Bike Dance, which reportedly is worth an estimated $60 billion as of 2020. Arthur Danchik, the co-founder of Susquehanna, is on ByteDance's board of directors, and they are ByteDance's largest U.S. investor. Some accounts claim that this is set to deliver the highest return in venture capital history. There are two other U.S. investors in ByteDance that we need to pay attention to as well, Goldman Sachs and Bank of America, who owns Merrill Lynch. Goldman Sachs was a lead investor during the TikTok seed round, and Goldman Sachs and Bank of America have a relationship ongoing with Susquehanna, operating as the registered clearing brokers. For the two specific Susquehanna MPIDs and BBIG, that's SUS and ETMM, we're looking at Bank of America operating as the main clearing broker. Goldman Sachs is operating their own clearing brokerage. In the eighth image of this DD, we see the full list of every MPID and BBIG that has been identified. So this is the uh, list of MPIDs, and that is the uh, clearing brokerage ID beside it, showing which of these entities are going through which clearing brokers. So Goldman Sachs and GTS Securities, of course, goes through Goldman. Flow Traders, Susquehanna, and then we have the various uh, Companies going through Bank of America, including Merrill Lynch and Bank of America themselves, Two Sigma, Canaccord Group, and Stonex Financial. And then we also have Susquehanna, Citadel, and Citadel Securities, which are going through a combined uh, combination of clearing brokers through Merrill Lynch, Bank of America, Citadel, and Citadel Clearing. So as you can see, there's a lot of overlap between the different market makers and their clearing brokerages. And we see the same actors appearing over and over and over again. It's no coincidence that Bank of America and Goldman Sachs are both cited as having the clearing brokerages for most of AMC and GameStop. As a matter of fact, Bank of America, it's been speculated, has been providing most of the shorts and the lending to the market in order to short the meme stocks that, are, that were most famous for creating the Great Squeeze in January of 2021. All of this data can be manually compiled from FINRA's Firm Operations and Industry Arrangements page. You can get this off of finra.org slash broker check. And I want to put special emphasis on the fact that none of these firms have accounts, funds, or securities maintained by a third party and also the firms listed under the Industry Arrangement page, showing that Goldman Sachs does not have books or records maintained by a third party. So they manage their own books and maintain them almost in total secrecy that are occasionally audited upon a manual inspection, which has to be initiated by FINRA as part of an investigation. And although they're not the main focus of our current uh, rabbit hole that we're diving down, I do want to put special emphasis on the fact that Goldman is one of the bad acting banks from the 2008 
uh, global financial crisis that was caught selling toxic securities to the market and then shorting those same securities at the same time. Goldman is famous for its nefarious actions and how it maliciously preyed upon other firms that it sold bad securities to, and they actually were fined for it as a result of their actions. Sadly, the fines didn't do hardly a damn thing, and they did take a payout from the government in order to save their bank during the uh, the massive trillion-dollar bailout package after the global financial crisis had hit its peak. So back to Susquehanna. Enter BBIG and Lomotif. TikTok's fastest-growing U.S.-based competitor is Lomotif currently. Susquehanna took a small position last October along with Goldman Sachs and Bank of America. During the March 31, 2022 reporting period, Susquehanna increased their position in BBIG by a whopping 1,161%. Goldman Sachs received, uh, increased by 149%, and B of E nearly closed their entire position during the same period. This is quoted from the NIS, who says, I believe this is when they took control of the stock. The change in the chart pattern is very clear in his opinion. Now for the real kicker, Susquehanna is BBIG's designated market maker. So here are the uh, demonstrated position increases from Susquehanna, Goldman Sachs, and Bank of America, where Bank of America totally divested all of its remaining holdings, while Goldman Sachs and Susquehanna simultaneously increased their holdings. Goldman Sachs either exercised or disposed of all of its puts and calls. Back here in the beginning of 2021, at the time of the uh, major GameStop squeeze, that was when Hudson Bay, one of the largest investors in BBIG, entered their position. And here in late February or mid-February of 2022 is when Susquehanna made its massive increase of its position. Susquehanna originally added to a position in October of 2021, but the major increase happened down here sub four dollars we don't actually know the exact time that they had entered into their positions because the reporting period for that time could have gone as far back as december so we don't know if they entered in at exactly this point or earlier on when the price had gone down to as low as two dollars and 20 cents but in any case as we can see vinko ventures susquehanna is their designated market maker so Niz goes on to state that Susquehanna is one of, if not the largest options makers in the United States and believes that Susquehanna is running the short game as well as the options chain in BBIG and has been for almost all of this year. Um, I'm going to interject here just to say I agree with this because Susquehanna is famously known for using short straddle. This is when you sell both puts and calls at the same strike price. The purpose of a short straddle is to um, sell both options into the market and your best profit is when the price of the underlying security is at exactly the strike price of both the call and the put. This renders the price basically net zero for both of those options. They both expire at the same price and exercising would be no different than purchasing the shares at market price. So Susquehanna makes a ton of money doing this, but simultaneously, they actually get tax breaks from this because they mark their positions as both short and long, and this is how they get around through a loophole in the tax code um, for short-term capital gains tax. So we've got the largest investor in ByteDance who helped fund TikTok along with two major U.S. banks, essentially in the most authoritative and leveraged positions over the stock of T TikTok's biggest competitor, Lomotif. Ever since they took control, we've been boxed in and can't make or hold any gains with historically high short interest, a decimated spinoff, and despite being at 100% utilization for three to four months straight with retail owning 70% of the total outstanding, they seemingly have an infinite supply of shares to dump and build resistance walls with. This is a disgusting display of market maker abuse and a blatant conflict of interest. I've gone ahead and attached a bunch of examples of violations and sanctions filed against Susquehanna over the years to show some examples of how they conduct business. There are dozens of these examples that they are definitely repeat offenders, but I choose the ones that offer the most detail and explain the impact. So the dates are all over the place. I'm also including some support material so that we can better understand who we're up against. So here NIS provides a list of the OTC or the non-ATS, that's over-the-counter uh, trading systems or all non-alternative trading systems. These are unregulated, i.e. 
dark pool and internalizer systems or over-the-counter trading exchanges that are not monitored or managed by FINRA. We can easily see that Citadel, Virtu Americas, and G1 Execution Services, that's Goldman, make up the vast majority in almost all of these cases, followed by Jane Street, De Minimis, and Two Sigma. So here's some of the attachments showing just how much of the options market is supplied by Susquehanna International Group, that's SIG, and uh, the market-making unit that was sold by E-Trade to Susquehanna for $75 million. So this pretty much concludes uh, NIS's compiled due diligence of the conflicts of interest. Now we can go back and uh, track through some of, uh, some of the other findings that I've made and share some of my thoughts. At the moment, there's more than 100 million global active users on the Lomotiv platform. TikTok, which has several, uh, several hundred million more users on its platform right now, is rapidly losing share in the market because of several other issues that have come up specifically that they've been sharing their data and collecting a great deal of sensitive data from its user base. TikTok has been flagged by multiple members of the cybersecurity community, including this deep analysis performed by security researcher Derek Banks from Black Hills InfoSec, and a truly terrifying comment from Reddit user Bangalore, citing his reverse engineering experience and describing all of the suspicious activity the app performs in the background and the sheer amount of access it demands at installation. This information has been circulated on Board Panda in the following article. All in all, TikTok fits all the criteria for a data harvesting app for the purpose of mass public espionage, and even has functions which enable it to remotely download and install custom binaries or executable code, the type of actions that are often taken by malicious, quote, dropper applications, which are designed to stealthily install malware such as rootkits. All in all, TikTok is one of the most dangerous apps that the cybersecurity community, a community which I am a part of, has been screaming about to the public for more than five years. We've known that TikTok is extremely suspicious and dangerous for public use, but it's largely gone ignored. Although this isn't the main reason for talking about this, Susquehanna is now locked into their share of ByteDance, which has been basically called out as a bad actor and maybe potentially spying on American citizens and other countries in the international community. This is a huge issue. Nevertheless, Susquehanna is kind of stuck in between a rock and a hard place, and this is a case for BBIG's success. The last part that I need to talk about is the Cryptide dividend, which BBIG's spin-off dividend of its new company, Cryptide Inc., caused a tremendous amount of confusion surrounding the actual delivery of its stock from the dividend. More than six months ago, Cryptide was announced to the public and shareholders of BBIG that there was going to be a spin-off and at some date in the future, shareholders would get additional shares of Cryptide in return for their loyalty and ownership of BBIG. After multiple delays, more recently, it was announced that by May the 27th, shareholders of BBIG would receive their Cryptide dividend in the form of one share of Cryptide for every 10 shares of BBIG. This was once again delayed as BBIG shareholders had trouble finalizing the process through brokers and their uh, underwriters. It was basically a hot mess, but that wasn't the real issue. After being thrice delayed from, uh, since the ex-dividend date of May 27th, it was further delayed by brokers claiming that the clearing firms had not rece received their shares for several weeks after the dividend was issued. Only as of July 7th, some BBIG owners finally reported receiving their tied dividend shares, which were originally intended to be delivered in early June. However, most of these shares still have yet to be received, and retail owners of the stock are exhausted, frustrated, and furious as the dividend continues to produce confusion and have forced them into a lockout, because any sale of their BBIG stock would cause them to not be entitled to receive their tied shares. So retail is stuck. They have been holding their BBIG for months and months and months, while the price declined from an all-time high of $12.50 down to a mere $1.05, and they still haven't received their tied dividend, as promised, six months ago. Market makers are under high suspicion for this and other activity, particularly surrounding the massive reduction and availability of BBIG options, which was reset to zero open interest once the dividend was issued. But there was, in fact, a massive amount of call options that miraculously disappeared the date that the dividend was meant to be issued as BBIG options were converted to BBIG1. These are the call options that are entitled to a dividend of tied shares. 
Currently, retail is getting screwed on options pricing and are stuck with position close only options previously purchased for BBIG. What was so suspicious about this was that the spread of the calls for BBIG 1 are trading at less than 40% of the asking price of standard BBIG shares because nobody was allowed to fucking buy them because it was hidden on the options exchange and moved to position close only. This can be seen from the memorandum that was issued by the SIBO and the OCC.com, which documents this change. This is the memo right here which shows that BBIG is being changed to BBIG1 and 2BBIG changes to 2BBIG1. The difference is that 100 shares of Vinco Ventures, that's 100 shares per single contract of call options, is entitled to 10 new shares of Cryptide, ticker symbol TYDE, of common stock. Beneath the surface, the options still exist, but nowhere on any exchange can anyone actually trade them because they were basically hidden from the market, and market makers are not making them available to trade. So only the market makers, i.e. Susquehanna, can buy them at the price that they dictate, which was pretty much between $0.01 cent and $0.05 cents per share, even for in-the-money options at $0.50 cent strike. So far, Fidelity is the only broker that I know of that's properly listing the adjusted options for BBIG1. Since writing this, I found out that TD Ameritrade has also been listing these options, but just like with Fidelity, it's in a hidden interface that you need to turn on adjusted options. You also are not able to purchase them. You can only close the position. In short, the market maker sets the price, and the price sucks. The spread is no less than $0.04 cents wide on OTM options and the bid on almost all of them, especially on in-the-money options, and it's far less than the prevailing market price per share. This is a screenshot from my Fidelity interface showing the difference between the open interest of the adjusted options as well as their price. You can see that most of them are currently worthless. Susquehanna is screwing retail because they are the designated primary market maker, and this is the real conflict of interest. Here I've provided the equities symbols list on SIBO.com, which you can see BBIG next to their company's name. You'll find that Susquehanna Securities is the listed designated primary market maker. So as a result of their position, Susquehanna has the ability to price in options and is the only entity which is able to open any positions in these options contracts. In addition, I want to point out that Susquehanna has been highly suspected of a bunch of fraudulent bullshit for a long time. Perhaps one of the most damning pieces of evidence against Susquehanna is their practice overall as a market maker and as an investment firm on Wall Street. Susquehanna actually is one of the lesser known but also one of the simultaneously richest funds that exist on Wall Street, and somehow they've escaped notice altogether by the retail investment community, despite some extremely shady business practices and an origin story that actually I didn't even know about until I had read this article from Justin Elliott at ProPublica. So the founder of Susquehanna, his name is Jeffrey Yass, and interestingly enough, they got their initial fortune betting on horse races. Apparently, the founder of Susquehanna, before he had even begun his firm, started making a fortune on betting at the horse races by getting help from a uh, doctorate statistician who worked from NASA on the moon land um, on the moon landing and they won a seven hundred and sixty thousand dollar winning uh, by betting on what was what should have been statistically an impossible bet by correctly guessing the horses that would come in place in multiple races in a row. The the attempted bet that they tried to place actually got them ejected from the horse track that they initially had started at, but they were able to repeat the process at multiple tracks for horses and greyhounds across the country. This article goes on for a long, long time, so there's not enough time here in this video to go over it all. But one, I would encourage everybody to read through this article because it's really eye-opening, the amount of activity that Susquehanna has and the amount of sway that it has on Wall Street as they've gone from being just degenerate gamblers at the horse track to becoming one of Wall Street's richest firms. They have their hands in virtually every sector of the United States securities and derivatives market today. In addition, the company itself gets massive tax write-offs. Uh, somehow, they are able to get complete write-offs for nearly 100% of their income 
um, as as individuals. Um, Jeffrey Ass himself actually uh, got a 100 percent tax uh, tax break by getting moved to a lower tax bracket, uh, along with uh, two co-founders of uh, Susquehanna, Arthur Danchik and Joel Greenberg. They themselves paid pennies compared to what other Wall Street investors had paid. And it's all based on tax loopholes that they were able to take advantage of in order to maximize their income and minimize the amount that they actually paid to the government, which this is exactly the problem that I've had with Wall Street firms in the first place. And these guys are managing to get away with billions of dollars of tax write-offs every single year. There's a lot more that this article dives into that I would encourage you to uh, read for yourself because it, it's a lot to digest and far more than I can cover here. But what I'm trying, to, the point that I'm getting at is that Susquehanna itself is a entity, a company that is known for shady dealings. Um, they have been operating in the shadows for the last decade within the market. Somehow few people know how it works or, uh, or what they do or how they make their fortune. Um, and insiders that have left the company have ominously described Susquehanna as, quote, a black hole from which not even light escapes, referring to the deep veil of secrecy that the firm operates under. Despite all of this, Susquehanna is not being looked into nearly enough by retail, and this is something that we need to place a greater focus on. To do this, I started looking into the SEC filings that were gathered up by Fintel on Susquehanna, and here you can actually see all of their current holdings, uh, including BBIG, but obviously not the, uh, not the only and certainly not the smallest holding that they hold on to. Uh, they've basically got their hands in just about every major company in the United States and abroad. And what I am looking for are other conflicts of interest in these particular companies that they have holdings in, which they are simultaneously the market maker of. This is a huge issue. Uh, I even recognize Clove for, for one. But Susquehanna being both a market maker and a investment firm puts them in a really unique position. The same as with Citadel and Virtu, but especially with Susquehanna because the firms are directly connected to its market making operations. So as we begin to go through all of these different uh, companies' tickers, I'm sure that we're going to uncover more examples of conflicts of interest. If you want to learn more about the uh, research that I've pulled up on Susquehanna, I have multiple links here within this uh, Reddit thread, which I'll provide the link to in the description of this video. I encourage you to go through these one by one the more you want to know. Probably one of the best places to get the consolidated due diligence is from this, uh, this thread that I had uh, prepared on Twitter. Um, you can read this on the Threadreader app. Link's also in the, uh, in the due diligence. I try my best to cover all of the information here uh, that I describe here in this thread, but uh, I'm sure that there's much more to find. Um, I'm going to be trying to compile and share as much of this due diligence with media as I possibly can before we take this to the SEC. Um, not that I really expect much to come of it, but um, I, I am somewhat hopeful, especially since Zash Global actually uh, made a public statement on Twitter stating that we hear you loud and clear. Zash has recently engaged in an investigative law firm to investigate dark pool activity with certain market makers and BBIG and Tide, um, directly responding to the, uh, the inquiry that was sent by NIS and some other members of the BBIG retail community. So Zash is starting to pay attention. Um, interestingly, I, I think that they're overdue. They should have been listening to us a lot, a long time ago, given the uh, activity and how much we have participated and invested, um, both financially and in terms of our time to this company's success. So hopefully something will come of this, but we will uh, no doubt see the uh, outcome months from now. The important thing to keep in mind is that right now the stock is at its uh, at its lowest point 
for now, the only thing that we can do is just keep our eye out on the stock and look for opportunities to buy the dip, which right now it's currently sitting at its historic lows. So BBIG at the moment sitting at $1.14 here as of after hours. We don't know where it's going to open up at tomorrow, but at the moment with all of the barcoding that's been going on, it's been difficult to establish some concrete technicals. But what I did notice is that this descending wedge on BBIG shows that it has broken to the upside and started consolidating here. And the price hasn't really been moving despite an increase in volume here and here. Right now, the volume seems at least a little bit um, higher than it has been historically. But we're still overall very, very low on our volume from the biggest moves that we've made in the stock, such as back on the uh, 19th of January of this year. So we'll need to keep our eyes open. At the moment, BBIG looks like it could go in either direction. It does need to choose a direction right now. Um, it's unclear if this is just a uh, bear flag or if it is a breakout. The one possibility that I see is that BBIG breaks down to $1 to attack this liquidity pool, at which point I expect the price to spike down through this pool and go as far down as 95 cents before rapidly retaking support above a dollar and starting to move to the upside. If this occurs, then I would be adding to my positions here above a dollar. Um, this is a part of my liquidity hunting strategy that I use frequently in order to detect the bottom and buy at the lowest price available before riding institutions wave to carry the stock to the upside. If you're unfamiliar with, lit uh, with liquidity hunting, I recommend checking out the video that I'll have linked here above my face where you can learn about liquidity hunting from myself and from other experienced traders that uh, describe how the system works. For now, that's going to have to be it. Uh, I'll be looking forward to seeing how BBIG reacts to the market bell tomorrow. Uh, until then, you guys enjoy your weekend, and I'll see you next time.
ominously describes Susquehanna as, quote, a black hole from which not even light escapes, referring to the deep veil of secrecy that the firm operates under.